Yes. So I. I'm super happy to be here today with Marty, who I met in the comment section. And, uh, and I was just uh, really enthused about his comments because it, it pointed out to me that he has a lot of missing pieces for the kind of work that I'm doing. And so I wanted to talk to Marty and uh, Marty, usually what we start with here is we have people kind of tell their story, how they came to where they are today. And so I'd kind of like to have you talk about that if you could, and then we'll talk about, um, I think we're going to talk mainly about Wolfgang Smith, but we'll probably get into some other things as well. Yes, of course. I made a comment very simply as you, you mentioned ideology and you've been musing about that in many different ways. Of course, there's many different ways we can even define that, but understanding your definition and uh, Christianity, I made a comment that uh, Christianity is an ideology unless we truly understand Judaism. So that's what provoked. And then you said, tell me more. And we went down a thread and I'll probably follow that thread a little bit. Um, coming to my, uh, I was born during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and so that puts me, uh, and my, my young, my brother who was a year and a half was born on the day John F. Kennedy was assassinated, but both of us were German immigrant uh, sons. We spoke German in my home. My parents, my mother was from East Prussia. She lost everything to the Russians and my father from Yugoslavia, but they were German people and they ended up in a little Baptist church in Cleveland, Ohio. And they were either, my parents were tailors and my uncles were tool and dye makers. And so that's the world I grew up with, a Baptist church very into um, understanding uh, theology, understanding Christianity, but they were the Germans who suffered immensely and they didn't seem to fit in with some of the other waves of immigrants, but they came to Cleveland to work. And so I grew up in this context and I remember as a small child watching The Hiding Place by Corey Ten Boom and it was like a horror film to me. So we began the discussion, you know, of course of the Holocaust and being a German, it's a taboo subject, but not with my church because they were Polish Germans, East Prussian Germans. And I pleasantly found out that in our church they were trying to reconcile and they didn't really know what was going on. So they were, my father, my grandfather was a tailor master in Yugoslavia, and he had Jewish apprentices and Muslim apprentices, and they worked together. So these are the stories I heard as a child. So I, I saw that there were Germans that were not Nazis, and that was, I was proud of that. And I always looked upon the Jews as something very special, and it kind of fit within what we have as dispensational theology. So when I made a commitment for Christ to follow him, it was actually a Keith Green Memorial concert. He was a Jew. And then there was also uh, Jews for Jesus who I was supporting and they asked me to go on an outreach. And I denied to go on an outreach with Jews for Jesus because I just said, why should I preach the gospel to the Jews when they gave us the gospel? They gave us Jesus. And it was, was kind of like a hold this thought moment, 1983. So I went to the nations as Keith Green told us to do before he was killed in that plane crash. And they made those memorial concerts. And I had this literature in my hand after I brought my youth group there and said they needed machinists, tool and die ma and welders on this ship. So I joined the Dula ship as a machinist in 1984. I did that for a year. And then of course- Now, wait a minute. The, the Dula ship was part of Operation Mobilization? <clears throat> Correct. And, and just for the people who don't know what that is, could you explain that? Yeah, these were missionary book ships. Sometimes you hear about the mercy ships. Uh, we were the book ships and we worked very close with the mercy ships, YWAM. It was founded by a man named George Verwer who's still alive today. And uh, the director at the time was George Miley and Frank Dietz. And these, these uh, people made tremendous impacts upon my life. And then the, just being uh, able to uh, come to Europe again, because I had been in Europe in 1981, and I had come to Europe often as a child, uh, and I saw already the secularism of Europe. I saw the taboos of my German family, and uh, I grew up uh, always wondering and wanting to preach the gospel to them, but they could care less. They were happy as atheists, and they had everything they needed. So I went to, I went to Austria, and in differentiating ourselves from Jehovah Witnesses, we would go to door to door with music and I could play the guitar. So I would sing at door to door telling people about Jesus. And the town I was working in was called Judenburg. 
and which was, I found out the history was like a Jewish enclave during the medieval times, and it had some history in there. So, so I always had this Jewish haunting thought, but I said, I'm not going to go there. Um, I studied at a school called Prairie Bible Institute in Canada. It was very dispensational, and you just started seeing things unravel there of, of the evangelical Billy Graham generation that I grew up in. And you saw the post-modernity issue being very front and center. Uh, then I went back to OM Ships. We, my wife and I had been married. Our daughter was born in Three Hills. And I went back to what was called the Logos II. And I worked there for three years. And at that time, I was seeing missiology as very social science oriented. So I decided to go study in a reformed seminary in Orlando, Florida, because I had always been interested in Francis Schaeffer. I've read all his books at that time, and I was also very interested in a theologian called R.C. Sproul. So when I entered the Reformed Seminary, uh, I knew right away I was becoming uh, in, 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 into a very highly intellectual uh, approach to the faith. But I also found out that they didn't like to be known as supersessionists, and they didn't like dispensationalists, but they liked to be known as fulfillment theologians. And okay, sure, John, we need to stop here for a second because it, a lot of this terminology is gonna, it goes a little bit over my head, although I, I have a slight grasp of it. For a lot of people who are listening, they're not gonna know what those three things mean. So supersessionist is what? Well, it means that the church replaces Israel. And in, in today's, in the most sophisticated theological spectrum of today, you have reformed of the, you know, Luther and Calvin's teaching as it's been brought forth and continually perpetuated in American evangelical today by people like John Piper and, you know, who would be a Reformed Baptist and then the Presbyterians and then the Dutch Reform. On the Anglican side, you would have a bishop, uh, Tom Wright, N.T. Wright. His teaching is very, very popular as well as a type of supersessionism, but because of the Holocaust, they would not like to be termed that way. They like to be called fulfillment theologians, but it's still a supersessionism. And being an Alliance minister, um, and this is why I became an Alliance minister, I believe that there is, there is a literal narrative to scripture. And this would bring us back to premillennialism that has been corrupted, I think, in the United States because of the, the Darby movement out of the brethren. Now, there were some brethren like George Mueller that did not hold to the audacity of Darby. And then that what later became encodified in, in the Schofield Bible and became a very big part of 20th century evangelical thought. Schools like Dallas Seminary, Moody Bible Institute were all ones that gave this type of theology it's you know american evangelical uh, scope and it also was very no, influential. so the, the, the premillennial viewpoint is what you're talking about Correct. right and the and the premillennial viewpoint would be that that um jesus would come and sort it out and there would be a hundred thousand year millennial reign correct mm -hmm. okay so it is like an apocalyptic gospel so okay so coming through the reformed years after i was in the reformed uh, seminary, I, I then took a job with the Swedish Relief and Development Organization, and uh, where my wife had had connections in Brazil, and I worked in developing organizations working for children, vulnerable children in 15 countries. So I lived in basically on an airplane. I had a lot of time to read, and then we lived a few years in Sweden, and I began attending an Anglican church, and I was never, um, even though through those years, I was actually ordained as a Presbyterian Church in America elder. It was a church in Orlando, Florida, and they still support us as missionaries, lovely people, friends from very special times who've always been with us. And um, I just enjoyed uh, having this diversity. I mean, I grew up in, like maybe you, ha having the interdenominational connections, and always that was very special to me. But, you know, knowing the nuances of our theological perspectives, I was always sensitive because in missions, sometimes we put those aside. But nevertheless, now I was working in the gospel indeed. You know, the, so much of evangelical was the word, Billy Graham crusades, preaching, 
the gospel and the word. And of course, I saw the holistic dimensions of the gospel and had a tremendous privilege to serve in those areas. But I also can, became theologically confronted with the abyss, the mystery. I mean, the reformed have a way of putting God in a box. And, uh, and it is, it is uh, you know, you get into these debates between free will and eternal security, you know, the Calvinist Arminian debates, and there's many things there, whereas in the Reformed tradition, uh, it's not just um, all about salvation doctrine and substitutionary atonement type of theology, but there's also these epistemological dimensions. So I was very involved in also learning, you know, how then shall we live, the old Francis Schaeffer, uh, the Dutch schools, the Presbyterian schools, uh, the old Princeton ways of common sense realism, um, I was looking at philosophy in a Calvinistic sense, and one of my professors there was uh, Ronald Nash, and he was, we had three schools of apologetics in Reformed Seminary, so it gave me a lot of things to kind of process. It took me 20 years to process it, and, um, but when I came to the Anglicans, I, I you know, of course, reading a lot more of, of C.S. Lewis and just seeing, well, what's the difference with Anglicanism and the sacramentalism and understanding the Reformation, understanding English Puritanism and the divisions within that with Anglicanism, Congregationalism, Presbyterianism, you know, and then there's John Bunyan, a little tinker Baptist from Bedford who wrote the most powerful book besides the Bible in the last 400, 500 years called Pilgrim's Progress that kind of highlighted really um, that whole era. So beautiful things, uh, beautiful theology, but when, when the, the 2000s came along, I started hearing about this emerging church and a lot of pushback against okay, the so be theologies. Be before we move to the emergent church thing, I wanna back up just a little bit and find out a little bit more about your background. You mentioned the, the difference between the gospel in word and the gospel in deed. And uh, <clears throat> it made me think about Jordan Peterson's emphasis on um, act, how our actions betray our values. So have you ever run into any of Jordan Peterson's work? Have you been listening? Absolutely. To uh, okay. And uh, there's, that's another reason I enjoy because I, I actually love his debate with Slavoj Žižek, and I'm actually more on the side of Slavoj Žižek, but I can explain that. I mean, maybe I like Slavoj Žižek's method. I don't like his conclusions. And I really, Jordan Peterson's method is a little bit, you know, more social science for me than, than, than classical mm -hmm. thinking, but I like his conclusions. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I, would, I, I, would, I would say his method is, his method is, is something unfamiliar to me, but I understand it because I have a revulsion against social sciences. I think it's an empiricism. You know, that's how we get data through the senses. And, and that's, that's the problem of our modernity. It's, it's our empiricism. And, uh, and that's where scientism comes. And I believe uh, Jordan, I think, you know, he's kind of he's doing this stepping back into the classics and stepping back into the traditions. And I think it's helping them greatly. So, so yeah, action work. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, a faith without works is dead. I mean, the Bible says it's straight. So, so yeah, I, I enjoyed, um, you know, a lot of these things were, you know, my daughter was re reading Velvet Elvis, uh, Ron, uh, what was his name? Uh, Rock. I always forget his name, but he was the one who wrote Love Wins. Uh, he used to do these Numa. Uh, Bell? Um, Rob, yeah, Bell? Rob Bell? Yeah, Rob Bell. Rob Bell. Sorry, sir. So that whole thing was going on. We had come back from Sweden and I was watching this and I was kind of like, yeah, he's got a point. He understands certain so now things. Now you're talking again about the emergent church, just for people yeah, who are trying to follow the yeah, track here. <laughs> yeah, and I, but I kind of left, I kind of right away thought they had good points, but uh, throwing out the atonement like that, that's dangerous stuff, but I needed to read on. So what happened in those years, I did a, a degree in diplomacy and where I just kind of hashed out my missiology. I started, I studied inter international relations theory and, and I was kind of dealing with the whole problem already of, 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 of Christian nationalism, the, the problems of evangelicals and the religious right. 
uh, because I had been living in Europe, I'd lived in Sweden, um, I've seen good socialism. So, you know, always these type of questions. But, you know, I always looked at, well, I have my own political convictions. I mean, I think that's personal. Um, I'm not aligning with the Christian nationalism, no. So these things kind of provoke things. And, and of course, in those years, I was reading a lot of Augustine's City of God, his confessions, again, always going back to the classics. But I came uh, to the, that, you know, to the real uh, radical um, uh, kind of way was with reading Slavoj Žižek's works. Now, he, he debated George Peterson about three years ago. And, and to understand Žižek, is, is a breath of fresh air because in those years it was the emergent church and then also these new atheists that were taking our children from God. YouTube had, and, and the internet was coming. So I was seeing this assault on our young people on both intellectually and by the heart um, and where Christianity was being destroyed from inside and out. And um, but Zizek was a breath of fresh air because he was, even though he was a Marxist atheist, and he still is, he, <laughs> he, he criticized the new atheist for what he was. So he began these dialogues with a, a man from the radical orthodox movement called John Milbank. Now Milbank- yeah, we, we did, just for those who are watching, we did a series of six episodes on John Milbank and radical orthodoxy. So I will link to that in the show notes for people who are interested. And Milbank, you know, is very applicable. Now the evangelical left has Stanley Hauerwas, an ethicist that is very popular. And, and you know, Stanley Hauerwas has been doing some serious work on Milbank's social theory uh, for many years. And um, so these type of thoughts have been very, you know, the University of Nottingham is kind of the groundwork for that. And they have a tremendous uh, analysis of the culprits of modernity. Now, here it is. So I understood very well then that evangelicalism Protestant has a problem. Then I started to read the, the writings of Charles Taylor, and I started to see, obviously, there's two directions we can go, the secular or the sacred. So I was kind of, you know, very enthralled by Milbank's work and, and a lot of the writers, Connor O'Sullivan, I think some of these various ones, um, and I thought they had a great critique on secularism, you know, of course, the uh, even even denying that secularism even exists. So, but where were they getting this all? Was the medieval? So when I in nineteen, or excuse me, two thousand ten, the Peruvian, my wife's Peruvian Alliance Church asked us, and I finally became a pastor. I had been a missionary. I'd done consulting. I'd worked even for League in Your Ministries, which is R.C. Sproul's teaching and. And, you know, having all my friends from the whole spectrum always accessible to me. I, I'm not here to burn any bridges, and I'm not going to change my church. I have my Anglican friends, I, you know, and my Roman Catholic friends. So I had the privilege to come to Italy to replant two churches in Milan and in Rome, and we decided to stay in Rome. So while I'm in Rome, I decided to study with the Catholic institutions. I thought I could get my doctorate. But, you know, in the ecclesial Catholic system, you have to step back. So I had to do a bachelor's all over again in philosophy, but it took me a year and it was my glorified Italian lesson. So I did it with the Salesians in 2012 and 13. In the, in the Salesian University, I met an Italian, Graziano Perillo, and he took me to the Dominican monks. And I met this German Dominican monk. And since I could speak German, I remember when the first time I met him, he goes, hello, I'm Walter Sinner. I'm a sinner. No, I'm sinner. He says, I'm a sinner. And, uh, you know, whenever, I, and we just connected from then. And I found out that he was the, the historian of the Dominican order on Meister Eckhart. And when I heard that, my jaw dropped because I had enough understanding of who Meister Eckhart was. But boy, I got to spend five years with him learning Meister Eckhart. I wrote a thesis on Meister Eckhart. And dear Walter Center passed away 2020. Um, there's a lot, I can write a whole book of my experience, but I studied with the Dominican monks. I thought I could do my, <laughs> I got into the licentiate. And of course, there you have to learn Latin. So it took me eight times on the ninth time. It was a charm, you know, to translate 
30 minutes of Thomas Aquinas and Thomas Aquinas is Latin is easy. I mean, Augustine, he's got the Latin, and, you know, but, but so I tried, but I had that privilege to be with Walter Center and take all these courses. I learned Thomas Aquinas very, very well. And my dear wife and I were working in this church. I was right there in the Angelican. Our church was in the Roman Forum with another brother, uh, a Baptist pastor named uh, Leonardo de Chirico, who is the expert, in my opinion, on Roman Catholicism from an evangelical perspective. He did his, he did his PhD at King's College on post-Vatican II perspectives of Roman Catholicism. But I love Leo because he would sit down with Catholic priests and, and he would just dialogue with them. And the way he would do it was such a winsome way. Now, I want to say this very clearly. My best friends in Rome were priests and nuns. I had a tremendous co camaraderie. Of them. But when I was in Rome, I would meet many evangelicals who swam the Tiber, who became Roman Catholics because of the problem of evangelicals, that we are superficial and they have therefore. So I, they used to ask me, oh, oh you a, when did you convert to Catholicism? And I always used to tell them, no, I'm not a Tiber swimmer. I'm a Tiber splasher. <laughs> so I, I, I wade into the waters, you know, so I made a lot of, I had a lot of good, I, I would never, I would never with my Roman Catholic priest and nuns friends get into polemics. I would just love to be with them because I could share them about my relationship I have with Jesus. But every once in a while I would meet the other ones and I would kind of zing them in, you know, little polemical things to my but I have, you know, plenty of friends who've converted to Roman Catholicism out of evangelicalism and Eastern Orthodoxy. And to me, and, you know, they're still brothers in Christ. I have no, mm -hmm. you know, I have no, uh, I've seen these trajectories in many people's lives. So it's not an issue, but this is my issue. My issue is let us understand the system because so much today we take atomistically. You know, we'll read a Henry Now and we'll read a Richard Rohr. And, you know, my wife's a chaplain with the Adventist and she was reading Henry Now and she was so excited. And I said, well, you know who he is, you know, but then I would explain it to her. But, you know, but that that's how Meister Eckhart and the mystical tradition has been very much part of the Christian Missionary Alliance. It, our founder, A.B. Simpson, and another name you may know, A.W. Tozer, were great students of the mystics. So that's what also now, see, I, when never, I, was, I never knew that about Tozer. That's really interesting. Yeah. And, and so the reason. So so hold I, on just a second. Yeah, I like to, I, this is surprising to me, too, about the CMA and Meister Eckhart. Um, well, Eckhart is Eckhart. Eckhart is the source of everything. Now, now, this, and this is this is a whole nother discussion in itself. The source of everything. The source of what yeah, everything. Uh, <laughs> Of, of Western mysticism. Okay. Because and, it's and before, not- And before we get it, into that, I, ha I have a question for you about the, your friends that <clears throat> have converted to either Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy. Based on your kind of assessment of, of that time period in their lives, do you have an idea of why they did that? I mean, I also have friends who have done that. And so I'm curious as to your observations. Yeah, that's that, that's a great question. I, I I mean, knowing American evangelicalism, I, I don't I don't blame it. So but that that, of course, in one way, you know, always takes the, the second look. Well, and so, but, but when you said knowing Western evangelicalism, you don't blame them. OK, that's a very inside statement as though everybody's going to automatically understand what you mean. So what is it about Western evangelicalism that is missing or that is on the wrong trajectory that would cause someone to go and convert to Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy, in your opinion? There's many different streams to it. It could be the sacramental. It could be the John Henry Newman arguments, you know, because he was an Oxford Anglican and he said, well, if you want to make yourself a historical Christian, you have to convert to Roman Catholicism. That's what he did. He's of that sort. There's the mystical, the ones who want to get more into understanding. Of course, Meister Eckhart was condemned, and I can talk all about that, by the same Pope that canonized Thomas Aquinas. So there's, there's, there's an interesting dimension here. Um, and then also, um, you know, 
I have many Swedish friends who've converted to Roman Catholicism because they say the Swedish Lutheran Church and most of Protestant, and this is now bringing it here to Europe, as, as just social, political, uh, liberal institutions that, that don't even stand up for the, the same values that they hold to. Um, so one of my good friends I've worked many years with in Sweden in early childhood development, she converted to Roman Catholicism. And, you know, I still work together. I'm on her board. And, uh, and some of my guess, best trainers in Kenya for early childhood development are Roman Catholics. And so I'm not, you know, their social, their social teaching is very important. And that's what Rome is. Rome is a depository of so many things. There's so much to glean from it. Atomistically, I see no problem with it, but let us understand the system. And when I read Wolfgang Smith, um, I see, obviously, um, he, he is trying, he's working within that system, but bringing in Meister Eckhart into that system is an interesting discussion. So I just wanted to hold that thought because I think we have two big, two big subjects here, especially analyzing some of his thought and then what we would think in Meister Eckhart, because it's not a mystical Dionysian. You have to understand the Roman Catholic mystical tradition is, is pseudo Dionysus, which is a Syrian monk that had a way of the names of God that were apophatic. This is not what God is. God is not this. And so there was this Neoplatonic mixture with Dionysus, and then the uh, St. Denis, as the French would call him with participation. So the whole Platonic tradition, and see, this was the thing. Thomas Aquinas in the first Vatican Council was affirmed for his philosophy. In a second Vatican Council, we heard that these new theologians who were trying to bring in the participatory Dionysian aspects of the mystical that Thomas Aquinas was, were not really allowed. Ratzinger was part of that. Um, you know, people like uh, Urs, Urs, uh, Hans Urs von Balthasar, you know, Karl Barth was his dialogue partner. He was kind of in the outside looking in. Uh, a, a great Jesuit named Henri de Lubac, that who is actually who John Milbank did his doctoral work on. So you, these are called the French Nouvelle Theologians. And, and they had a new reading of Thomas that was against the Christian philosophy of Etienne uh, Gilson, who most, you know, most reformed polemics against Roman Catholicism targets that, but they have no clue of what it really was transpiring in the 20th century with this participatory, mystical, Dionysian um, Catholicism. Now, here it brings in Walter Senner and Meister Eckhart. Mike, w Walter Senner was always looking for why politically Meister Eckhart's thought was condemned in Agro Dominico. And that was in 1328. And it was by Pope John the 22nd. Now John the 22nd canonized the thought of Thomas Aquinas in 1323. And Thomas Aquinas, you know, when he would died, he lived only 49 years. He wrote 8 million words. There was no one like Thomas Aquinas. He was a genius, uh, the greatest mind probably even better than greater mind than Augustine. But Thomas, um, you know, was also indicted with these Aristotelians. You have to understand there was a lot of things hashed out in the University of Paris by the bishop, and there was condemnations on the Aristotelian thought. Now that's another whole subject. But you know, eventually he was, he was rehabilitated because you mean, on, you mean on the debate between Plato and Aristotle? Is that what you well, mean? Well, it's no, it's not even that. It's uh, you know because um, Ar yeah, Aristotle, even Plato wasn't really read then. Plato didn't make his comeback until the Renaissance, but that doesn't mean there weren't Neoplatonic elements. Like I said, see Dionysian, the Dionysian corpus brought in these Christianized Neoplatonic elements. And of course, with the church fathers, there's a lot of that. So that was there, it was already distilled and processed within the church fathers. That's why orthodoxy and all these things have a tremendous advantage in these things because they even go back further. 
However, um, Aristotle brought it back in a way of, of, of the scholastics in, in their distinctions. And see, this is the great difference with, with Roman Catholicism and its high scholasticism and then Eastern Orthodoxy and its mysticism. And there's lots of nuance to that. But the Dionysian corpus is the closest it gets. Now, here's Meister Eckhart's thought was condemned 28 articles. My mentor, Walter Center, said Meister Eckhart would not have been condemned if he simply subscribed to Dionysian participation as a mystic. But Meister Eckhart intentionally said, this is not what I'm talking about, but he took Aristotle and Plato and turned it in on itself, put being you know, he took, well, he did something that the early church fathers did every taking, you, you were talking about being qua being, you know, that's Aristotle's metaphysics. Anything Thomas Aquinas wrote on being was Aristotle. That's how he filtered it. So God is analogous to our, you know, we are analogous to God's being in proportionality, the language of analogy, university, equivocation, all these types of things are components in developing metaphysical teaching, cause causality, the four causes, participation now is the platonic, you know, in the, in, in the unum, in the one and in the good, you know, the, and then you have uh, the true, the ver verum, and, and you have, of course, pulchrum, which is beauty. So, you, you know, that, that, that's from the platonic tradition. And Thomas Aquinas did a very good job of synthesizing all that. I mean, it's just that he wrote eight million words, nobody couldn't read them, but uh, read them all. I mean, his Summa Theologica was kind of a, kind of a, a, a handbook, but, you know, his Summa Contra, Contra Gentilis was a polemic, but he wrote so many questiones disputates in a style that, I mean, once you get through all that material, you really see who he was, and of course, Thomas had a revival in the 1800s with the Vatican I, and they, because that was their, that was the Vatican's you know, they lost their power. The, 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 the Garibaldi breached the walls of Rome and he made the Italian state and, and the Roman Catholic Church was held hostage in Rome for 50 years until Mussolini gave them their Vatican Treaty. Well, you know, the Pope saw it. That's why he claimed infallibility because he saw it. we lost it politically. But now we have to bring Thomas back. This was Leo, Leo the 13th. He brought Thomas back and he brought Thomas Aquinas back because he saw not only were we attacked politically, we were attacked by Darwin, we were attacked by the German higher critics. So the Roman Catholic Church gave it all they had with Vatican I, and they did a tremendous job of salvaging something. And, and, and so, uh, and of course, it was also a polarization for many, because it was the ultimate synthesis of faith and reason. That's what Thomas did. So it's such an attractive, formidable system, and it had its and it had its um, admirers, but there were always its detractors, like Tyrell, and then came the Jesuit novitiate named Martin Heidegger. He couldn't hack it with the Jesuits, but Martin Martin Heidegger, you know, he held always held his cards close to his chest. Nobody knew what he was going on to. But what he did is he was already reading Meister Eckhart's sermons. He was taking Thomas's mystical tradition and he throws out his teacher, phenomenological Husserl, um, you know, the whole phenomenological tradition, which comes from the Austrians. I think you've had some experience with the Brentano and, and the, the von Miesian extrapolations of that into economics. But Martin Heidegger, put up the question, what is metaphysics? So he took, he took Thomas Aquinas' essay and essentia. That was the great work of Thomas Aquinas, being an essence, in God being an essence are one, but in all other creatures, it's, it's separate. So Martin, Hed Martin Heidegger went and saw that being 
das sein we have actually being we have the for, what he called in german sein vergessenheit we've lost what being means because we've made it an onto theological thing we've associated being with god so he had he he had an easy thing just to blow thomas aquinas up and asking the question, what is the metaphysics and bringing being back into the actual human being, being there. But my, Meister Eckhart beat him to it. Meister Eckhart already blew up Thomas Aquinas because he brought being back to the fact in his first Parisian question that God is being. Now, everybody flew off the handle because they think, well, that's pantheism. No, he had his distinctions. This is Huck being this and that. So he went, he was part of the German school of the Dominicans and Albert the Great had this distinction, this or that being. Um, and this or that being, you know, this is the, the, the being of God is everything. But Meister Eckhart brought it back to the church fathers that being and knowing are the same in God. So God is a knowing being. He is intellectus. And that was the great distinction of the Dominicans. Now, this, this is a very so deep Just a clarifying question really quick. So being and knowing are the same in God was um, Meister Eckhart's um, kind of pushback against Aquinas? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And he, and he, in, in, indirectly, he took the, he, he took the, I mean, to, he saw the dialectic already happening with Thomas, but he brought it to its logical conclusion. Now, it's not, it wasn't really nothing new with the church fathers, because what was Meister Eckhart's proof text, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. So he, 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 he you know, and Meister Eckhart wrote his Gospel of John commentary. And basically, the whole thing is the first 18, uh, first 18 verses of the first chapter of John. It, and basically, he said he's, you know, and, it, and it, it's a Platonic or Neoplatonic interpretation, absolutely. But, you know, that gets into the intricacies of the debate of the other order, who were the Franciscans. And they, of course, followed Augustine a lot more closer with the light of the mind. Uh, there's others like Henry of Ghent, and uh, they were they were very anti-Aristotelian. So when you come into uh, uh, the, the the higher Middle Ages, you see that there were like William of Ockham, and he was there when Meister Eckhart was tried, and he called him crazy. But just as William of Ockham is the grandfather of the empiricist British analytical tradition. Meister Eckhart is the grandfather of all Ger German philosophy. Leibniz, Kant in his ethics, Hegel, absolutely. And Hegel's dialectic took it into the synthesis, which was not how Eckhart did it. And then obviously, um, Martin Heidegger reading Eckhart's sermons, not only the philosophers, also the German pietist tradition and the school in Halle. So Meister Eckhart is everywhere. But he's gone as far as Japan. I mean, because Meister Eckhart's thought resonates totally with the highest not only of the Greek Gregory of Palma, but also with Eastern thought. And many of, you know, Suzuki, the Zen Buddhists even studies him. So Meister Eckhart has two societies in his name today. One is exclusively in German, very into the intellectual. And then there's more of a, a, a romantic accessible society in England that reads them from a different angle more mystically. He's probably the most comprehensive. And when you come it down to it and you want to be an atheist and, uh, and still have spirituality, Meister Eckhart will give you plenty of fuel. And then we know Oprah's book, book club has got Eckhart Tolle and who did he get his name from? So it's everywhere. So um, I've written about it extensively, but see, when I see Wolfgang Smith, tap into Meister Eckhart being a committed metaphysician, uh, you know, I, that's, a, that's a very clever move um, because it is divine immediacy. And, but 
the problem with that divine immediacy for me is it's it's a realized eschatology and i would beg to differ as i differ with most of the christian tradition that uh um you know a millennialism started by by uh augustine you know it was already there but you know and that brings us to the jewish question well not a bit but hold on a second. When, one of the things i wanted you to explain to me was this comment that you made that that um divine immediacy is a realized eschatology what do you mean when you say a realized eschatology if you look in the last three chapters of wolfgang's book um and it's uh i'm gonna you still see me here i'm gonna put on my broken glasses and I'm going to put the book here. Um, uh, he has this wonderful, uh, uh, I love his, uh, this, I just got to get the, the vertical ascent the, from particles to tripartite cosmos and beyond. And, and, and he, he, here he goes right here. He talks about Hans Kung, who was okay, very you're, you're not You're not on the screen right now. I mean, the book is not on the screen. So are okay. you sharing? You know no, how to I don't do want this to do. share no, screen? Oh, yeah, share content. Okay, I'll do that. Okay, I'm going to do that. I'm going to try that right now. Okay, yeah, sorry. I have it on my Scribd account. Let me, let me see if I can do this. You um, should be able to look at the, the, there's a little green box at the bottom of your screen that says share screen. I made it possible for you to share <laughs> screen. So you just hit that okay. and then it'll bring up your desktop. Then you just have to decide which screen you want to share. Okay, zoom screen. Um, yeah, I, I, I saw that I got to okay, share content and then screen. Yeah. So, um, start broadcast. Um, so are, are you still there? I, I yeah. can still hear you, but I can't see any visuals from your screen. Is that it? Is that it now? No, nope, just me. <laughs> There's just me. Here. Okay. Okay. Well, it's in his lap. It's not, and it's his, in his penultimate chapter no it's third the third chapter from the end okay it goes in on, vertical ascent the third chapter yeah, vertical ascent end. yeah i think it's chapter it's chapter 12 at the so, end so it, so why don't you come with, back why don't you come back since we can't see your screen just come on back so i can see you again oh uh, yeah because i had my that, that's where i was reading that was where i was reading my uh <laughs> so, oh okay <laughs> but i can do it this way too i can kind of put you on the side i have this ipad so i'll just put this up here i got it okay so hans kung of this world are thus egregiously mistaken when they conceive of the parousia, parousia as an event of course as christians we believe the parousia is when we will be taken up with jesus and be forever with him in it then into his millennial kingdom when he comes but he has something namely that happens in time as we have seen the very opposite holds true and whereas the final determined Termination will come on that fateful day no man knoweth. The parousia, parousia is able, by the very fact of not being subject to temporal bounds, to manifest itself in an infinite number of apocalyptic events. For instance, in the catastrophe of AD 70. So he's, he's, he's speaking of certain preterist notions that are within fulfillment theologians and amillennialist thinking. Ever since the so resurrection, what does what does preterist mean? I mean, I could look it up, but it, it means that 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 every that Jesus's prophetic pronouncements on in Matthew twenty four all happened when the temple was destroyed in Jerusalem. Now, there's very, there's there's degrees of that. There's semi preterists, but most amillennialists are preterists in that sense, and most uh, most even Eastern or Eastern Orthodox are pr preterists in a certain sense too, because they don't even use the book of Revelation or the apocalypse in their liturgy. So ever since the resurrection of Christ, the parousia has in fact been near at hand for the Christian. So that's realized eschatology. And, and I don't deny that. I mean, I believe this is why I'm an, 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 uh, 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 an alliance minister, because A.B. Simpson had the fourfold gospel. Jesus saves, Jesus sanctifies, Jesus heals, and he is our coming king. Now, A.B. Simpson was a historical premillennialist. He wasn't a dispensationalist, although he gave Schofield plenty of airtime and sold his Bibles. But the reality is the kingdom of God is not here yet. Now, the slogan in 20th century New Testament studies out of the Germans 
and then regurgitated by George Eldon Ladd that the kingdom of God is here, but not yet. Okay, you've probably heard that plenty of times. Well, I, I disagree with that. I believe the kingdom of God is not here, but it is within us. And that's why we pray thy kingdom come. Now, to understand all these things, we have to understand Judaism. Because Judaism preaches an apocalyptic gospel. Are we going to over-spiritualize everything? Meister Eckhart was the master of allegory and over-spiritualizing things. And there's lots of great we can glean from him. But as an evangelical who believes that I'm not going to sort this world out, no Christian nationalism is either. But this book is a narrative of a people that were chosen. And it's a, you have to really understand the way that they see things rather than how I, we as Christians see them. Now, I made that, I started that way. I became. You mean kind the, of, when you say this book, you mean the Old Testament? Yeah, the, and I like to call it the Tanakh. Okay. Because the Old Testament is a derogatory term. Yeah. And the New, yeah. the new Testament as being established. Is, is not correct. We've, it's been deposited, and that's the kingdom of God in it. It's been deposited in us, but it is, it's, its physical form and the land, the city, Jerusalem, is, is going to see its fulfillment. Now, um, this is where I began my quest into Judaism. I started with an Amer uh, the faith the, the Logos Bible software has a, had a scholar in residence, Michael Heiser. He's, he's a fascinating guy and kind of a blue collar theologian, but he began writing his books about, oh, uh, I'd say, you know, earlier, about 10 years ago, he started writing books. Then he started writing books about the spiritual realm, and he was pushing back on a lot of these ancient astronaut theories, and I thought he had a very good point there. But, you know, he was a Hebrew scholar, and, and I started getting into the Old Testament with him. And I think he has a lot of great things to say. But Michael Heiser doesn't understand. He's never studied Judaism. And I started to fi find things as I started to study Judaism. And this is, this is with, with, of course, the Chabads. The Chabad houses are all over the world. They were started by the Lubavitcher Rebbe's, um, you know, the... Shmirson, who came, <clears throat> we were from the same gender. Remember when Bob Dylan got saved? Yes. Yeah, you know, I love that song, you know. Uh, you know, so. You're going to um, serve somebody? Not only that one, I just love that when he, when I believe in you. I just, oh, I love that song. Mm. Just, I mean, I feel, but you know, then he, he was kind of, even, you know, this is the pro, you know, Bob Dylan's a perfect example. I mean, he, he the, the evangelicals, and I don't know his heart. But he went back to his Lub he went back to the the Crown Heights Brooklyn Lubavitcher Rebbe, and he he kind of started studying Judaism again, trying to figure out what happened to him in the early 1980s. And I got this beautiful picture of him in his hoodie, next to you know the Rebbe, the Rebbe who died in '94, uh, and that's a whole another story. But he started this whole Chabad movement, and they're all over the world, and uh, and and I find. They found their sanctuary in New York and Crown Heights, and and I think they're you know the whole Chabad movement um, is an essential study. If you, if a Christian is going to do Jewish studies, they have to study them because they are. You have to understand the Holocaust destroyed Ashkenazi Judaism. Now here's the problem with Judaism today, and it's the same problem we have with uh, Thomas Aquinas, even though. Thomas Aquinas was a genius. Moises Maimonides, or what they call Rambam, was also a genius. And he did the same thing with Aristotle. He brought the rational in. And, 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 and this is what kept Judaism. And he was a Sephardic Jew. But he also was, you know, somewhat of an appeaser to the Abbasid Islamicists. Now, <clears throat> You have to understand that um, the Ashkenazi Jews and the, the probably the greatest, you know, movie of of, of 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 depicting their life was Fiddler on the Roof. I'm sure you've seen it. 
So the shtetl in the Ukraine and Belarus, and, and the Ashkenazi Jews were the first ones taken to the, the gas chamber, chambers. They were the, the cream of the Jews that understood the messianic tradition. And many out of them, there came other messianists. And, and there were a tremendous, uh, uh, I got so much to say about that, but there was a messi the messianic tradition is carried with them. And in their Yom Kippur prayers and in their Rosh Hashanah prayers, they're praying to the Messiah for the forgiveness of sin. And it's Yeshua. Uh, and Yeshua is known. And of course, Rambam, the Mohammedan uh, influences have over-rationalized Judaism. And that they, they gained the stronghold in the new state of Israel. But Crown Heights- Could I, ask a, could I jump in yeah, with a question ahead. here? <clears throat> When you're talking about the Ashkenazi Jews um, in their Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah prayers that they're praying to Yeshua, I was reading the scriptures uh, yesterday and ran across something in the Old Testament that said salvation. And I thought, well, I'm going to go back and look at the inner well, layer. That's it. That's and, the word. And, yeah. And, and <laughs> salvation was Yeshua. There it is. And so can you can you when you're reading the old testament every time you now there are many he uh hebrew words that are translated salvation in the old testament so they're mm -hmm. not all yeshua so you have to go back and look at each one because some of them are some other word but many of them are yeshua and whenever i run into that particular hebrew word can i just replace that with jesus well it, it they even have it a broader to the prince of the presence yeshua sar hafanim metatron i mean these are all the angelic you know abraham when he sat down with the angel of the lord who was the angel of the lord he was the well, that was messiah jesus, right yeah 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 and this yeah. these apparitions of jesus <laughs> throughout the old testament is judaism and you don't understand. And, and when he appears as three, you have to understand. He did the same thing on the Mount of Tr Transfiguration. So you have the Spirit of the Lord, the Word of the Lord, and the Prophet of the Lord. This is, this is Judaism. Now, Judaism has a Talmud. And there's Yeshua HaNatsri. And then there was Mary Magdalene's son, Ben Stadri, who have corrupted their understanding. But within the Ashkenazi rabbinical tradition, and here we go to Kabbalah. What does Kabbalah mean to you? To me? Yeah. Well, I've, what I've do, heard... What, what do, well, how do you react when you hear that word? Well, <clears throat> when I first started my channel, when I would hear Kabbalah, I would think, oh boy, this is scary stuff. We don't want to go there because, I mean, years ago, I had heard that it was some system of secret numbers, some Gnostic, you know, secret truth that only certain people could know. And my own perspective of the faith is that even the simplest child or the person with the most severe mental handicap can understand the gospel. So they don't need to have some secret truth told to them. But then I began talking to people. And one of the lovely conversation partners I've had is this uh, Jewish psychotherapist from Canada. And, um, she talks about the Kabbalah being a way of looking at the underlying meaning of the words in the scripture. And that totally I understood because there's so much depth in the words in scripture that those words grow in depth, not only synchronically, but diachronically through time, they grow in depth because of I don't know why, but I mean, you can just dig down and down and down and down with every word and find new depths of meaning in these words. So would it, would it, would I, it I totally like, understand that aspect an, of Kabbalah. Would it be analogous to doing the Mandel Broad set and seeing those <laughs> fractals? It is. A, a little is. bit, yeah. yeah. And remember, Benoit Mandel Broad was an Ashkenazi Jew from Lithuania. Hmm. Now, Kabbalah, very simple. It it all it means is theology, the received tradition. That's all it means in Judaism. And a student in the yeshiva cannot study it. 
a yeshiva student is a little a yeshiva student in the in the Crown Heights tradition of Brooklyn, the, the Chabad Lubavitchers. They take the little boy, wrap him in a sack, and bring him to the yeshiva. I love that, so he doesn't see the world. And the Hasidics train him in in the the uh, tradition of the Torah, but and the Talmud and other, the mission, mission is very important because the oral tradition in Judaism is essential. And the New Testament is essentially a Mishnaic work. Now, they cannot study the Kabbalah until they're 40. Now, does that make sense to you? And there's reasons for it because you've explained it because there is the dark side to it. And, and this, is, this is, there's lots of illustrative event, you know, and of course that depends a lot on their Maimonidean influences, because Maimonides wanted nothing to do with the Kabbalah. He was an over-rationalist. He was an anti-Kabbalist. However, because he did, the, he did write the Mishnah Torah, he has studied. Now, um, that's a whole nother discussion in itself. But to put, your, to put your at ease, as I've been put to ease over these last few years, the Kabbalah simply means theology for the Jew. It's the received tradition. That's all it means. And, 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 and for someone not to study it after, you know, before the age of 40 means something too. So, so that's, that's very important there. Um, now what you're talking about is gematria. Gematria is it all, you know, all Jew, every Hebrew letter has a, has an ordinal number up to one to 10. And then it goes on the, 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 the decimal, the 10, 20, 30, and very special numbers as the Hebrew alphabet has. And uh, <clears throat> there are many people that, that, that are experts in the gematria. And that's, that's not totally Kabbalah. Kabbalah is really the tree. And this is where I, I chimed in on your channel because it's the Sephira tree. That's the upper with, the tree. Ten, with the 10. Yeah. Yeah. And then. Yeah. And, and, and I've been listening to a really fascinating series of lectures about that mm, tree. Mm, super, yeah. super good teacher. Uh, and he's. So he's this really is where I chimed. Tree. Yeah, this is where I chimed in because the fruit that Adam and Eve ate, and I ran this through my Jewish teacher, and he said, oh, you're, you're spot on. He says, the dot is the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and they ate the fruit that is of the intellect and of the will, that one that's missing. And that basically is the Western tradition. And, uh, and, and that's okay. I mean, we've analyzed it. That's why I look at someone like a Wolfgang Smith is the perfect describer. I mean, he's a better describer. And they, all these things are descriptions of truth as mathematics is all your great, whole, all these great people you've interviewed in neurosciences, they describe things so beautifully. But the only prescription is, you know, the holy scriptures as they've been given to us. Now to understand that prescription as it's given to a Jew is different than it's given to a non-Jew. And that was sorted out in Acts chapter 15 in the Council of Jerusalem with the Noahide laws, you know, because we have to understand there were two houses, the Judaizers, the Beit Shammai, and then the Beit Hillel during Jesus' time. And Jesus, what was he doing? He was taking on Beit Shammai. The apostle Paul was Beit Shammai when he persecuted, but he kind of got his, came back to his senses because his teacher Gamayel was Beit Hillel. And, and these two schools at the time of Christ were um, the reason why, why, of course, so much of our Christianity going back now, we look at well, Jesus hated Jew the Jews, or Jesus was anti-Torah. No, he didn't ever said that. But he was anti a certain school. And in the book of Acts in 15, they, they had all kinds of things they would throw on. And of course, we know it was the circumcision issue at that point. But, you know, Peter stands up and he says, why do you want to put this yoke on the Gentiles? And what is this yoke? It's not the yoke of following the law. It's not that a Jew hated to follow the law. The, 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 they, they find pleasure to send their child to a yeshiva where they're just absorbing the Torah and then learning the Mishnah and the oral tradition. I mean, that's, their, that's why they're chosen. They were, they were given the oracles of God by a holy God. 
and 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 we as Gentiles, and of course this brings in Esau, and that's a whole other thing. They have the Torah of Esau, and see Esau, he forfeited his birthright. He was chosen to be the priest, but he forfeited it. And of course Abraham also had a son named Ishmael, and uh, when Sarah died, he married her. Her name was then called Keturah, and so. The, these traditions are very important because they give credence to what happened in the Middle East. And, and the reason I want to come to this point now is what accelerated my Jew, Judaism conviction is, you know, when I took this on this assignment here in Italy, I'm here to work with refugees and Muslim immigrants. And so I've been studying Islam anew. And I'm studying Islam with a number of people, and they had this they had this guest, and this guest uh, kind of tied everything together for me because it seems like in Islam there's a lot of research now showing that there really wasn't a Muhammad, there wasn't a Mecca. Uh, these are things created 200 years later, and there's many different versions of the Quran. But I look at Muslims in and as 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 having lived here in Europe as holier than I am. I mean, if they're practicing Islam, they're putting me to shame. And who am I to judge them in their submission? So I wanted to understand this. So God gave me the privilege of meeting a Shabbati Jewish. He used to be a secular Ashkenaz and he's got a full scholarship from Cambridge. And he's been, he has a channel called Red Judaism. And, uh, and, or he has to be incognito because he, he's got harams, he used to live in Israel, and it's been tremendous threat on his life and family. But he became, an, he, he recited the Shahada, which is the Muslim confession in his student union while he was at Cambridge as a student. So he became a Muslim. He was an Ashkenazi secular Jew. He was not circumcised. And he became... Um, a Muslim, and, but he had some good advice to look into uh, some of these uh, Gnostic type of sects, they're called the Paulicians, who ended up in the Boga Mills. And these were kind of like forerunners of the Waldensians. We have them, they're always these movements that were not part of the institutionalized church. They were fiercely persecuted. But he did his, he did his um, expertise on understanding um, the first six centuries. So he understood the Syriac lectionaries and all the materials that made up the Quran. He understood the Judeo-Hagarian context and also the Judeo-Arabic language. So that was his specialty. And he became a believer in the Jesus Yeshua HaMashiach through that research into the Quran. So, and then of course, he came back to Judaism and, and now, you know, he was in Israel for a while and he has this channel and he's a very good friend of mine who teaches me Judaism. And um, so I, uh, I, I lost the thread. So that's, that's just kind of, a, I lost the thread for just a second because you said he was an Ashkenazi secular Jew who became a Muslim. And then now did he come back through that avenue to Christianity or did he is he now a Muslim? Well, well, he, became, he came back to he came back to Judaism and believing in Yeshua Hamashiach, believing okay, in Jesus so, is the Messiah. Yeah. So what you what Jews for Jesus would call a fulfilled Jew? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he's a Jew. Jew who believes in the Messiah. Yeah, but he 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 looks upon movements like the Messianic Jewish movements that we have in the United States and. It's kind of like Jews have been grafted into Protestantism, he says. So that's kind of, and it's an interesting thought. And we're, we're having a number of discussions on it. Um, but nevertheless, he's been, he's been my teacher. And all I can say is um, he, he's, he's, I mean, he's, he's, he's a genius. And, but he's, he's a man, you know, who could be academic. And this is always the thing. He's, the reason I, I understand Judaism so well is because it's not, he's not coming at it really from an academic though he's he definitely he could get his you know he still has this full scholarship from Cambridge but he's there's nobody there to teach him but 
where he has really learned Judaism is through their oral tradition. And, and this is a powerful thing because Judaism, I think what we've missed in Christianity with our sola scriptura approach, and this is a problem as I get back to American evangelical, we have our little Bible studies and we do the, you know, I'm living here in Milan. This was the city that Augustine waved his finger in the air and he came down into Romans 13 and it told him to stop fornicating because he was a playboy lawyer here in Milan. And, you know, because he heard the little kids in the courtyard screaming in Latin, tola lege, and he did his, uh, you know, well, I'm, what am I going to get from my scripture today? And he popped in there and read that scripture, and that brought him to his conversion point, which he writes in his confessions, and because he was enthralled by Bishop An Ambrose and his rhetorics. But he came to faith here in the city that I live currently and uh that's the story of augustine and i think that's a lot of how we do bible study in america we just kind of wave our finger and plop into the psalms or plop into what this means today and we just forget again that this is this is a system of religion revealed by god and there is a systematic way to approach it and that's what talmud means talmud simply means disciple talmudin and that's why they uh uh, crafted these wonderful works, the Jerusalemi, because they saw the Torah tradition uh, waning and they had to write it and know how to pass it on. And then they went to Babylon, uh, the fourth century Babylonian Talmud, and uh, a lot of out, a lot of out of the Babylonian Talmud came the scriptures that made up Islam. So really, Islam in its initial stages was a Messianic Jewish movement. Because Muhammad, the, the name Muhammad, <clears throat> uh, and there's lots of uh, scriptures here, like the God of the presence, um, believer, was known as a believer. And so you get into Saudi Arabia, and I can only give you a, a real sketch of this. I mean, there's so much you can access to learn about this online now, um, and especially through... Uh, seeing, you know, that basically all these things mean that there's a lot more in common. And I'm not talking about an ecumenism of, of pluralism. I'm talking about an exclusivity of Yeshua HaMashiach for, the, for these faiths that we are as Abraham's children. So I hope... <clears throat> so so I, when, I, you, when you grew well, up, um, before you, you said you became a Christian, you said roughly in the early 80s. Were you a yeah. teenager at the time? Or? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean. Did you grow basically... up in a Christian home or did you yeah, grow Absolutely, up... yeah, absolutely, yeah. But, but when, so when you were younger, it didn't make sense to you and then all of a sudden it did? Or yeah, I mean, the 1970s there? was uh, was fun and wild. I mean, I was, I grew up in Cleveland, you know, I, I love the rock bands that would come I was never, you know, I saw, I remember <clears throat> I was just trying to get out. I just had turned 18 and I was allowed to uh, go into the clubs. And I remember I went into the Cleveland Agora and I saw this band and I, they were like a punk rock band. And I go, well, they're not really punk rock. And it was you too. I mean, I, I was blown away. I saw Bono before, you know, he was famous. And I mean, of course, I saw all the great rock bands in Cleveland. So that was our world. You know, we had a great radio station. It was all about rock and roll you know, and smoking pot. And, you know, so I took some LSD once in a while, but, you know, I wasn't in, I was a German, you know, and I wasn't a beer drinker. All my friends were, so I was always the designated driver. Um, but yeah, then I just kind of came to my senses. Um, you know, my brother was studying uh, the Bhagavad Gita and he says, and some Hindu stuff. And he just says, well, just read the Bible. Oh, that's a great idea. So I just started reading the Bible and I figured it all out. Because we would get together, we would have parties and we'd always have deep discussions of life and, you know, how, how things were. I mean, I was, that, that's how I grew up. Um, you know, money in my youth that I grew up with, we all kind of had that same trajectory. And then finally, when we got our lives sorted out, we, we had a Bible study and, and we, uh, you know, used to, uh, grow in the Lord and did things uh, in the early 1980s to outreaches, went and shared the gospel with people on the streets. And 
so yeah, that got me into missions. And then I worked with the Boys Brigade. And uh, I look back at all those years as, uh, you know, God had his hand upon me. I could have been easily uh, sucked into the world of, uh, and um, I look at those around me and those who followed Christ all through these years, uh, um, you know, as maybe in a different way. Uh, maybe they haven't taken such a radical trajectory as I have, but I was always young. When I was young, I was always restless. My mother would say, so I love to travel and I joined the ship ministry. And over the last 35, 40 years, I've been in over 70 countries with the ship ministry and have been wow. given a tremendous privilege, uh, to serve God. And, uh, and a tremendous privilege to study and read, you know, to be, to be someone who follows hard. And it's just simply Christ in me, the hope of glory. That's all it is. And the older you grow, the, you know, the more you see yourself needing uh, his holy presence and knowing how unworthy you are. Boy, um, isn't that the truth? I mean, having to face that every day. <laughs> but... The, but the interesting thing is that that does not lead to despair. It just leads to joy, you know? Yeah. So I, I think a lot of people hear us talk about, oh, I see how unworthy I am. And they think, oh, you're hiding over in a corner, feeling sorry for yourself or something like that. But all it does is point out his glory and that he is, you know, merciful and compassionate and slow to anger and abounding in love and, uh, pouring out his grace and mercy on me every minute and holding the universe together every moment. So <laughs> results in a lot of joy, but I want to go back and ask one more question. We're, we're, we've only got maybe 10, 10, 15 minutes left here. Um, you had mentioned at one point that the, the issue of being and knowing are the same in God and, uh, yeah, well, that's the issue. I mean, that was Meister Eckhart's first yes, Parisian, yes. or second Parisian question. The first one was God but is being. And then the one about said, God is being, um, yeah. you said now that's not the same as pantheism. So I wonder if you could tease that out a little bit. What, when you think of, because that's one of the big questions that's happening right now yeah. in our little corner. So mm -hmm. much of what we're coming to conclude seems as though um well when you, when we say that jesus is all in all that that can sound as though we're bordering on pantheism is it a scary thing to border on pantheism is there a dividing line how would you protect yeah. yourself from getting into the the negative part of that that kind yeah. of question i guess is what i'd like you to help me understand you know i know in our three three uh traditions i mean the orthodox have their theosis uh, we as christians have varying uh uh views of sanctification of course we have a debate between protestants and catholics on that justification and sanctification distinct distinction um but it is it is uh, a union with christ it is a mystical union and uh meister eckhart <clears throat> wrote a lot about that in various ways and but you know with the scholastics they had these distinctions that and i think the creature and the creator distinction um as it is expressed is obvious i, I think we you know and i'm reading in wolfgang's book we have this desire to be like god um but you know that's where the occult Kabbalah tree comes in because we want to do it our way. What is Satanism? Satanism is simply do what thou wilt, to quote Aleister Crowley. I mean, it's not the devil in horns. It's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a, a seductive, Luciferian, bright, shining uh, type of light. And, and I think there's, there's, there's a way um, where... <clears throat> we get lost in those things unless we understand the creature and creator distinction. Um, we, we look at ourselves as finite. And I think unless we understand that and take that 
very seriously and not do Romans chapter one, where we suppress the truth and unrighteousness, which is the easy way of all humans. You know, we, we, we know that uh, our nature is, is fallen in some way. I mean, of course, if you want to describe it in the Augustinian terms, uh, origin had a different way of looking at it. I mean, in our Christian traditions, but Judaism has an interesting spin on uh, the way they look at Adam and Eve, that it was just like her, her decision to step from a greater world into this world and take on the project of, of, you know, free will and doing it better. And, and I, I always look at the scriptures. I mean, I mean, unless we absorb the scriptures and see that God is God, he is, I mean, he is inaccessible light. Uh, the Nicene Creed states it so well, which was still a very Jewish creed before the other creeds of ecumenical Christian, you know, kind of marginalized the synagogue and the Jew and we constructed a Christ that was human in a way that would give us sanction, um, perhaps as, 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 as humans to have deity. But in Judaism, you know, the Ein Sof, it's the inaccessible light, the God, the Father. And, and of course, he is one. He is, that's why we say his, we don't use the Tetragrammaton. We use Hashem. The name, uh, ha, ha, you know, the name of God, Hashem, the name. And, and so in Judaism built in with God's revelation, we always have to come back to the fact that there is the creator. He is the source of everything. And, and of course, Meister Eckhart, I'm not agreeing with how he brought these or or how people have taken these things <laughs> because that's what i'm saying i mean i i believe his condemnation by john the 23rd was very well justified he did what he had to do to guard christendom at that time now because his ideas did they had this unstable element that went into various ways and and it, it you know there's 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 things there where thomas gave the roman catholic church its nature and grace symmetry to continue to 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 be the sacramental religion where the where the where the church could have control now i disagree with that as well but at the end of the day uh there there is there is an order to religion and that's why i we always have to go back to judaism and the way it was revealed to us and it was revealed to us by a creator god and uh his you know, the distinction between him and his energies perhaps is better. There's, there's so many ways. I mean, it, it, is, an, it, it is a language type of, uh, you know, we, what, what can our language really describe? And, and, and language is important. And, and, and it's interesting, even with Aristotelian metaphysics, uh, you know, we have the substance and then the 10 accidents or 12 accidents, you know, substance. This was what Heidegger was pushing against, the substance ontological being God. But, you know, these things are not even in discussion today in philosophicals, especially in the continental tradition as it was brought out by the Frenchies. The French philosophers in the 20th century, Sartre, Derrida, Foucault, all these, Levinas, Alan Baidu, and all these, these philosophers of this tradition where they've taken further the relation. You know, Martin Buber, I think, set it into the trajectory of Martin Heidegger, who I like to call the biggest fraud of the 20th century philosophically, because he, I mean, he <clears throat> really just took Thomas and Meister Eckhart and threw God out. And, you know, all these distinctions they would make between this and that being, because there is, there is human being, Dasein, human being, what, what we're doing. And that's where we got this term in 20th century uh, philosophical existentialism. And basically it's, it's done us very well because we've had a very affluent life and we've been able to express ourselves in with our existence and what we do. And, and, and basically it wasn't that the, the medievals didn't understand that they knew very well all about that. Um, and, you know, a medieval monastery was a case in point. I mean, it was where every, 
where, where, where life was held, where life was done, where botany, herbalism, alchemy, I mean, you know, the structure in the feudalistic societies, I mean, first were the, were the Celtic monasteries, you know, even in the Switzerland, St. Gallen, that was a Celtic, but then the other orders, the Benedictines became more political. So that's why they had to have these renovations of the Franciscans and the Dominicans, these orders that came in that were mendicant, mendicant, beggar orders, you know, to live in poverty, that whole struggle always to see that this Christian life today, this kingdom that is within me is a life that is of suffering. And, uh, and I think obviously with our affluence of modernity, uh, we've lost that. And then and that's why we're struggling. We just, jacked back and forth by so many things um but being you know being i mean we talk now of being is ontology and we talk about being and doing and being of character and and obviously to know true being is to know the character of god doing is the energies of god i mean we are created in his image and that sephirot tree describes it and the yesod you know the 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 below the yesod is the muck we have the, the the crown and it we don't know i mean i often am intrigued by muslim uh, not muslim a mormon theology and I, now i, I want to be very careful here what i say but <clears throat> um the you know i've tried to understand mormonism and 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 how what they see eventually that they will one day have their own planet and rule that planet. I mean, it's an intriguing thought. What are we going to do in eternity? I don't know. But all I know is, uh, is first we have a thousand years to, to where he's going to come and rule with an iron rod and sort this place out. And I believe we're going to use the Kabbalah as the roadmap to make it right. And we're going to bring justice. I mean, those promises are all throughout the Old Testament prophets. I mean, if you take those things allegorically, uh, you, you, you paint yourself into a corner. Those things are going to be worked out physically. We're going to see it with our eyes. Now, how this is all going to pan out is yet to be seen. But I, I, cannot, I cannot bring myself to any greater hope than the blessed hope that Jesus come, Maranatha. And, and being... Yeah, obviously he's coming. He's coming to rule. He is the head and we are the body. And uh, for that reason, uh, I wake up every morning knowing that that conviction. Why does that sit within me to follow that way? Um, because his Holy Spirit lives within me. And, and that's the blessed hope. And that's how we're to encourage each other. It's, it says in Thessalonians, encourage each other with these things. You know, it's it's... There's Jesus, even his life. What was it? The joy that was set before him. He endured the suffering of the cross. And I think a lot of the things we have with the sacrificial and substitutionary dogmatic dogma arguments of, you know, if we throw that out, we don't have Christianity. I think we miss the fact that the suffering and the substitution is what we should be going through. Uh, why, why would why well, I mean, Paul... you know, Paul talks about how I make up in my body the suffering of Christ. Yeah. You know? And uh, yeah. I remember years ago when I was a new believer reading that and thinking, what on mm. earth is he talking about? You know, but, but mm. the older I get, the more the more that starts to make sense, because I was thinking about this in terms of um, a discussion I was having on some other comment thread about conformist theory trying mm. to understand what conformist theory was and i i still don't think i actually understand what conformist theory is but what it brings into my mind is this picture of um through a lot of the study that i've been doing i i started coming to the conclusion that there is this space occupied by jesus that also is the same space that is reality and that is truth and goodness and beauty and the way and the life this is all the same space and that that is the reality that we're being called towards and so as we seek to align ourselves with that reality if i'm looking at this from the jordan peterson viewpoint as i seek to align myself with this reality 
what's actually happening, you know, in the scripture, it says that um, I grow up into him who is the head, but yes. then, right? Um, so I am in him, but he, then he is also in me. And those two things working together actually create a kind of an impression, almost like a wax seal, so that that, that impress is what I am becoming. But that impress is very similar to the idea of suffering, the word for suffering in, in the old, in the, that verse in the New Testament where Jesus says, suffer the little children to come unto me, permit them, permit them to come unto me. That permission, we have to give permission for that kind of suffering. And that, that giving of permission is what allows that impress to take place in our lives. And so, yeah, anyway. <laughs> That's Meister Eckhart. That's Meister Eckhart. The is whole it really? Yeah. But you he, said he there's a lot struggle. of stuff about Meister Eckhart that's a problem. So am I am I getting off into a weird well, spot? Well, no. <laughs> well, I I I I wanna say uh, that's that's still to be that that the jury's still out because he he was condemned. A lot of things that he wrote were were burned. I mean, just to find his manuscript, his Latin works were actually used by the Nazis. I mean, to uh, perpetuate the German superiority of the race. <laughs> I mean, I mean that's how, how brilliant Eckhart was. But but wasn't didn't doesn't, Heide doesn't didn't Heidegger mean, also fall into that trap? I mean, Heidegger, oh yeah, Heidegger, also? Heidegger became a Nazi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, because he was looking for that social cohesion. He saw maybe that's what was being offered by the Third Reich at that time. When I'm when I'm speaking of that, I'm speaking more in terms of the religious. You know, when, when we're trying to be guardians of orthodoxy, um, uh, the Catholic Church had to do that. For you know, I'm speaking. I'm putting myself in the shoes of the Pope here. <laughs> so you know, in terms of religion, and uh, because it obviously allowed. Uh, I can send you some really good talks on Eckhart. One is by John Connolly. He was a he did a wonderful book on Eckhart, and 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 I would suggest reading Eckhart more from people who've analyzed him philosophically as a philosopher rather than a mystic, because that's where a lot of the trouble comes in. Because this, you know, we have enough today where we can transcend certain boundaries, but but there's a great. Uh, a work uh, of John Connolly, uh, Living Without the Why. Uh, Living Without the Why. John Connolly was an Amherst professor, but he did a very nice little talk on Eckhart. It's on YouTube. I can send it to you. It's very it's accessible. Great. It's very accessible. I like, I'd rather have his, uh, you know, there's lots of great scholars on Meister Eckhart. Mm -hmm. I mean, to, to simplify his thought would be a travesty. He, 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 just, he just keeps giving and giving and giving. I mean, obviously, there's truth in many different things. We find truth in Eastern yeah. religion. We find truth in, but I mean, I, when we compare him to his brothers in the order, I mean, I remember when I told the dean of the philosophy, you know, you have to understand this. A Catholic priest is trained three years first in philosophy before they even touch theology. So they're, they're taught Thomas's metaphysics. So I had to study in the philosophy department with the Catholics. You go into the theology department, there's, you know, that's where they accommodate everything. But in the philosophy department, as you were fine for the serious people who really want to be conservative, and I have conservative in their Catholic faith, they study Thomas Aquinas in the philosophy department. And I remember the dean coming to me and he said, so what interpretation are you going to give of Eckhart? <laughs> because, you know, that's, that's the way he is. You can take him anywhere. And you can say he was some medieval revival preacher. I mean, it fits kind of like my, and he was. I mean, his sermons were powerful. He would preach. And there were a lot of these grassroots movements. And it was amazing, their theological uh, sophistication, you know, for being people in the dark ages. But that's why I say the, the, the whole tradition and all religious traditions are, are I think we need the C.S. Lewis, di, you know, like faith and reason, all these things are dichotomies. They're basically when we split them apart, we analyze them, we killed it.
<laughs> you know, we have something. Well, it's like it's, it's like all binaries. I mean, that that's right. Pole, all binaries. All is essential, right? The pole. You, you is kill essential. it. You kill it. You kill it. Faith. You know, you can never separate faith from reason. Cre credo ut intelligentum. I, I believe in order that I may understand. But here's the one I always like. The you know the C.S. Lewis. Uh, uh, I hope C.S. Lewis was doing. I mean, I find a lot of C.S. Lewis. Uh, in, I, I enjoyed that conversation you had with the well, the, um, the brother, uh, the Catholic brother who who was saying, "Is ecumenism possible?" And he he mentioned oh, Gavin Ashen. CS Gavin Ashenden, a very influential writer. I that Dame Iris Meridoc on Stanley uh -huh. Hauerwas. But um, but when you get into uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me the 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 whole the whole aspect of um, yeah, the the the, the, the oh, of course Iris Murdoch plan who who was I talking before I just I just went on ahead a little bit digressed oh. or went uh, Gavin Ashton um, I think yeah 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 Gavin well C S Lewis sorry going back to C S Lewis sorry well C S Lewis. Uh, the way you read C.S. Lewis is with discernment and imagination. And I think that's, a, that's the valid, that's the dichotomy of our age that we need to hold together, a discerning and an imaginative style. I mean, the creature and creator distinction, if, if, if you're living in this world and that's not obvious to you, I don't know. I mean, if you think you're, yeah, we all got, but what, well, what does it mean to be God? And what does it mean to become like God? And is, we we're created in his image. That obviously means that something is going on, that we're, we're on some type of trajectory. And if we follow the right way, we're going to attain something. And whatever we do attain, um, it'll only make me more humble. And like you've heard the old adage, you know, when, when I get my crowns in heaven, I'm going to cast them at his feet. Uh, I don't know. Like I say, if you're a true believer, and you don't find that that you're not needing him more, uh, and that you think you've arrived, um, that obviously is not right. But if you're needing him more, and you can say like Paul, I'm the chief of sinners, you know, it takes it's 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 the Mandelbrot set, you know, it just goes deeper and deeper, and it never ends, and uh, and so. I don't know. I'm just rambling on now, but no. I but I think that I question. think that's a good. That's probably a good place to wrap it up for now. I, although I think we have lots more to talk about in the future. If you if you're willing to come back again, um, well, I, I I love I love what you're doing, and I love um, the guests that you've had. I love your inquisitors, your accessibility, and uh, you know if you if you we can. Yeah, I'd love to come back. Maybe do a more structured thing a little bit. Yes. Uh, as I'm learning more in some things in Ju Judaism and helping Christians understand Judaism is very important sometimes. Well, I and think it would be very interesting to take that uh, that Sephirot tree and take yeah. a look at that. And uh, if you can figure out how to share a screen, then you could yeah. have some uh, some graphics because I think it's very difficult to just talk about that, describe it without actually having it in front of us. And then, and then of course, Meister Eckhart. I'm I'm always his, his thought is so fascinating and it is at the end of the day kabbalah um so well, so let, mean, let's plan that for the future and for now yeah. we'll uh we'll wind this up with with your last comment that that every day we should be learning more and more how much we need him mm, mm. yeah for sure so thank you karen a, thank it's been a blessing art and thank you for responding to my comment and uh and for giving me the benefit of all your your many years of study, it's been it's been quite a, a I've got eight pages of notes and I didn't even get close to. <laughs> well, the thing is, I I sensed right away when look I at was all that stuff. <laughs> I sensed when I was listening to you that we we had a similar trajectory, uh, and I and that, that was confirmed as as we spoke and beforehand and and i love your guests i think you're 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 doing the right thing and you know i've got in some Italy, great I, guests I, I, coming up i'll tell you i'm going to be speaking with wolfgang smith again 
very soon with Wolfgang Smith and John Verveke together. That's going to be since, a great conversation. Since I'm in Italy, since I'm in Italy, I'm just going to give you a Godfather quote because it was a, <laughs> it was a fabulous film. But you know, um, I, I've learned all through my life because of my parents growing up uh, with people who were different than them, and then oftentimes, you know, you have your others uh, who call them enemies, you know, or you know, we're not like them or, you know, always this divisions we have within humanity. But I always love that quote from the Godfather, Michael, you know, keep keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. And that's where I've lived. I've lived always with those who I don't disagree with. I want to be with those type of people. Not that I even really understand why I disagree with them. But to understand them, I think, is is the greatest thing we can do as humans. I think because God has tried to understand us because he's given us free will. And uh, so that's that's kind of how I leave it. That, that's a really interesting perspective. I always think about that line, even angels long to look into these things. Mm, mm. We're, we are so perplexing, we human beings. <laughs> it's been great talking to you, Martin. Have a wonderful day and my best to your wife as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, she's been here listening. <laughs> so she's... <laughs> Uh, it's good that she's hearing this because some sometimes she wonders what I'm up to and what I'm thinking. I've been able to express it. No, I know. So great. Thank you. Bye bye. God bless you. God bless you. Bye -bye. God bless you too.